Hello and welcome to the 10 Ideas in 50 Years uh, video series. I'm Jeff Cliff and I am coming to you to, uh, I guess, try to describe 10 ideas that I think are important, that I think that you should know. Uh, this is the third video of the series um, and hopefully there'll be a place to comment, uh, any corrections, if there's any details that I get mistaken, or if there's anything that you're confused about or have any questions at all relating to the material, I'll try to answer them in the thread provided. Um, today's, I guess, idea, or paper that the idea comes from, is going to be uh, one games with incomplete information played uh, by Asian players. And that's by one John C. Hacksen. And so, the, the, just to kind of review what, what these videos are about, uh, again, it's, it's not to give a full uh, course on game theory, it's not to give a really detailed uh, view of, about these ideas, including this one, and the, the ideas surrounding them, so much as to give a, a little bit of an understanding, so that if these came up in a conversation, you'd at least be somewhat familiar with them. Maybe if you didn't understand all the details, you'd at least know you know about them, you'd know where to go, maybe in Wikipedia if you want to look up some further details about them, you know, you'd know about the paper if you go read it yourself, but just to give kind of like a, 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 an overview uh, so that you, you can at least have this uh, idea in your toolkit uh, to play with. So, uh, a little bit on John Hassani uh, before we get started. Uh, he won the, I guess, equivalent of the Nobel Prize for Economics, uh, along with John Nash, uh, who you might know from um, the Beautiful Mind uh, movie. Uh, so th this is not a small player in the field of game theory. He's uh, one of the, the larger players. And uh, he's a Hungarian, uh, spent some time at Wayne State University uh, in D Detroit uh, between 1961 and 1963, and eventually moved to Berkeley uh, by 1964, where he stayed for quite some time. Uh, he was part of a team of game theorists who was tasked with uh, advising the United States on arms control and uh, nuclear deterrent, uh, disarmament policy. Uh, so th this is not a going to be a kind of up in the air in, in a hot air balloon, you know, pure new pie in the sky idea. Uh, th this is going to be something that was actually applied, that actually kept the world from going to nuclear war, and it's actually worth keeping in mind, uh, given that. Uh, for the first time since the Cold War, there is now going to be more nuclear weapons than less in, in theater um, in the next couple of weeks uh, in Norway. So th this is actually going to be something that might be a little bit topical. Um, and so hopefully we can continue to, to learn these lessons and to continue to apply them on both sides of the, uh, I guess, the nuclear fray uh, or potential one. And so th th this is going to be kind of a, a little bit of a background of why the Cold War turned out the way it did, why the United States took the policies it did, and so on. So the, uh, I guess this paper in particular was received in 1965, uh, and it was re revised until 1967. So this is something that came a little bit further after the first two papers, and the first two ideas. And in fact, it does actually build a little bit on them. Uh, so. Uh, it does cite the, the first, set, I guess, paper or idea, and although it doesn't actually cite the second one, it kind of builds in the direction of the second one. So some of this will start to sound a little bit familiar. So kind of getting into the meat of it, uh, this is starting to get into uh, the first treatment of game theory by uh, Bayesian statistics. And so the, the idea was is that up until this point, uh, in the history of game theory, there, there were there was a lot of progress being made. Uh, there was progress being made uh, by John Nash, by von Neumann, and there was a lot of problems that were considered solved or at least tractable. But there were certain things that they were still having trouble with. And so one of the the kind of core ideas here is that to take the the troublesome spots in game theory and to apply the the ideas from Bayesian statistics into them to, to see if they can resolve some of the difficulties that they were having. Uh, this proof for full. Uh, so, I guess getting into it a little bit. Uh, 
uh, the first kind of two concepts that are necessary to understand uh, what's going on here is the idea of C games and I games. This is still from the, the, the game theory that led up to this. Uh, the basic idea is that C games are, are games of complete information. These are games that are finite in length. These are games where the, the players have more or less full understanding of the, the rules of the game, of the, the players and their opponent strategies, etc. Whereas I games uh, are games that I guess do not have those. Uh, these are either uh, games that are, I guess, potentially boundless, uh, games that are uh, where the players do not necessarily know uh, things about each other and about the perhaps the rules as well. So up until this point, uh, the C games were seen as the tractable uh, or, or things that they, they knew a lot about. With I games, uh, there were they seemed to, there, there were paradoxes lurking in the background. They were having a little bit of trouble. With that. And so what Harsanyi is going to try to do is he's going to try to rephrase the I games that he's encountering uh, in terms of C games. And we're going to see how he does that. There's going to be an assumption that uh, Harsanyi is going to be making here that's going to be crucial for a lot of the arguments that, is going, that are going to follow. And that is what is called the Bayesian hypothesis, uh, which is that if you're in the situation of a game uh, in this context, uh, so this is going to ne not even necessarily be a competitive game, but a game in, in general. Uh, the Bayesian hypothesis is the hypothesis that your opponents or the, the people you're playing with are not stupid. And in fact, that they are optimally intelligent and that they are using Bayesian probability, or Bayesian probability the laws thereof, uh, to govern their actions. And so that this is going to be a constraining idea uh, on their strategies and on the ideas that they're going to come up with. Um, and we're going to see a little bit about, in cases where this does not apply, how you can rephrase that uh, so that the, the, the ideas still work out. But from a starting point, uh, the, the, the basic idea that people are not dumb, that you're, you're starting from this standpoint, uh, is necessary for these ideas. So keep that in mind. Uh, we are going to assume, for the purposes of this video, that other people are not stupid. And I know this is going to be kind of a hard thing for a lot of you to to wrap your head around, especially the really bright of you. Um, you know, how, how can you imagine a world where people aren't stupid? Well, you know, we're, we're gonna we're gonna try. There's going to be three different models that Harsanyi is going to use to try to structure his uh, interpretation of how to deal with eye games in a Bayesian way. Uh, and the first is a, what he calls a random vector model. And uh, strangely enough, it's going to include a vector. And this is going to be comprised of information that you have as a player. Uh, so this is going to be, for example, uh, in the context of business, this could be your bank account balance, your cost, the distribution costs, your distribution network and how it works, uh, a whole bunch of information uh, relative to your business. And then your opponent or your, I guess, uh, competitor who will also have their own, I guess, version of this, their own seat with their own bank account balance, their own costs, their own distribution network, uh, and distribution costs, etc. And so uh, this will, will be 
my treated as a vector and we'll see kind of in what ways it is random as we go. We also are going to have a game uh, which we're going to call G which we're going to want to basically solve uh, as a system or as a set of equations perhaps uh, but we're going to see if we can define this game G a little bit formally. And so uh, what do we need to define this G? Well, one of the things we're going to need to define this G is a payoff function. Which is going to have So this payoff function is going to be a function of two sets of things. It's going to be the set of strategies, or the sequence of strategies specifically, uh, at each point in the game. Uh, so if you are a business, your first move or your first inter interval of time is going to uh, include you acting under a strategy S1. And then the second interval of time or the second turn or the second move will be strategy S2, etc., etc. And likewise, we have our, our, I guess, vectors of the relevant information that your player is acting upon in turn one, two, three, all the way up into N. And that this is going to define a payoff. So the sequence of strategies and information given those strategies. Uh, will will give you a payoff, and so the game now is going to be kind of a similarly structured uh, set of, or set of sequences, uh, starting with the strategies of the first player. And th this, this game is going to be from the perspective of a player. There's a lot of things in, I guess, the, the Bayesian view of statistics where you're doing things not necessarily from the perspective of the game, but from the perspective of a player. So you are a business, you are trying to cre create this view of the whole you know, economy or local economy, perhaps you're a, you know, a nuclear power, you're trying to create a view of the potential nuclear uh, battlefield, um, and, or at least the, the geopolitical arena. This is going to be the set of your strategies, uh, the set of in your information vectors, the set of the payoff functions, and these are. Now, this is a little bit I guess broader because it also includes the set of other strategies I guess that your opponent may use. We're going to get a, a little bit more in detail about that as well, uh, but we'll, we'll kind of leave, leave that aside for now. Um, so this R is going to define a distribution uh, basically based on the, the cross product of the information that each player has. and so. So if A is the information that only your player has, and B is the information that only your opponent has, this, the combination thereof, is going to create a distribution. And we've talked a little bit about distributions and kind of the implications in the first two videos, but 
again, the, the, the details of how this exactly works are not all that important. The important part is just to note that there is this kind of combination of the information that you can model about yourself, the information that you can model about your opponent, and that this creates kind of a distribution uh, upon which you can act at any given point in the game. to kind of summarize a little bit. So the game is going to be the combination of all possible strategies from each player at each move, the combination of all possible states of information available to, to each player at each move, the combination of expected values to the player for each strategy at each move, and the combination of information uh, available to each player. So already you should notice we're talking about a lot of information here and a lot of things to kind of cut down on and to kind of give context uh, this is basically a strategy of throwing as much information as possible into the model and seeing what sticks uh, and the problem of is this computationally tractable hasn't really kind of sprung up in, in its entirety at this point uh, we're going to try to do a couple of things to make this more practical, to make this, uh, I guess, dimension of, this enormous dimension of possibilities constrict a little bit, uh, but the, 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 the fundamental idea is still going to be, uh, to a large extent, modeling every possible outcome and then kind of drilling down on to the, the desirable outcomes within that. So the first thing that we're going to want to do is that we want to remove from this, this enormous kind of collection of in information, the information that no player knows about the situation. It is not all that useful to, for example, the United States, if neither the United States nor its opponent in the nuclear arms conflict uh, or potential arms conflict like Russia knows about, for example, oh, I don't know, say the Israeli Mossad hacking into both nations' computers and computer networks and removing the abilities to fire nuclear weapons. If neither player knows about that, uh, that's something that both player can, can model in, in their, I guess, um, view of things, a view of possible states. Uh, but if neither of them know that this is happening, this is something that you can kind of remove from the situation. And so you're going to want to remove from, I guess this is the, the information that's not known to be there. So from this B, we're going to create a V star, which is going to be a, a condensed version of V, uh, where the I guess condensing happens based on this part for your, I guess, your particular part. So, So th this kind of combination is an extremely high uh, dimension space, and it selects from that space a pair. So it's basically a function from all possibilities to a payoff, just as the previous one is, but it's done so in a specific way to really compress that, that dimensional space uh, down uh, to that payoff. Uh, in a perhaps a more specific way. And I believe there's a second step to get the 
B from this, which is enormous ugly looking integral uh, and again it's not necessarily not necessarily to I guess drill down and fully get where this is coming from but we're going to try to explain it here so the, the value of this game so that the payoff to the player uh, fed in with the arguments of the strategies this a0 and a0 is specifically the knowledge that is unknown both players. So it's, it's, it's the, the knowledge that the first player knows that no player knows. If that isn't a little bit too recursive here. Uh, as well as the things that they do know iterated over the the information that he does not know combined with the information that he knows along with the information accepting what his opponent knows as well as the information the opponent knows given the particular I guess, piece of information that the opponent knows. So th this is going to be for each thing that the opponent knows, is to keep this given this concern. So, a, a little loopy, but we'll, we'll kind of take that. So R is going to contain information known to all players, and the information, I guess, given to So yeah, R, R is going to contain the information of all players. Uh, P, which we'll get into a little bit, uh, is going to contain the information just known by the player who's playing, who you basically who you are. Uh, the notation B to the I in this case is not actually the exponential uh, function, uh, but it's actually the um, I guess the probability of C to the I is equal to probability of known to both players of that I being true given that you know. So a little bit confusing, but the, the basic idea is is that there, there's going to be a lot of this kind of iterating of or around the idea of if you know something, what are the odds that you would have known that thing? Uh, if it was true. And 
what are the probabilities that you would know that thing if it was true in the game? So not necessarily whether you as a player would know it, but if it was true whether within the context of that game you would know it. We haven't lost completely everyone here, but so the, the, we've, we've built this game G, which is this really uh, kind of maybe complicated you know, set of strategies and I guess vectors of information or collections of the relevant information, the um, I guess information known to both players and the payoffs at each stage. Now, this game G is for, an, I, I guess, for an I game, or, or for uh, a game of incomplete information, uh, is, is going to be in, kind of intractable knowing what they know at that current point. So what Harsanyi is going to do is he's going to try to define another game, which is still a C game, but it's going to be defined in terms of the I game, and it's going to, we're going to basically try to create another game based on the original game with the hope so that if we solve that game, that can kind of give us a little bit of uh, progress on the, the one we're having trouble on. And so, instead of the players not knowing certain things, we replace the, the game where the components are, uh, I guess, designed so that the each player knows all the information in the game. And if we can do that, then we, by definition, will have created a C game, or a game of complete information. And so, if we can do that, then we will have made that progress. And so, the approach he's going to take is it's a little bit out of the box. Um, and to kind of get a, a context as for why are we are talking in terms of all the possible strategies, when he says all the possible all the possible strategies, in this context, he really means all the possible strategies. Uh, so, if you're starting to play a game like chess, you're not really assuming from the beginning that, for example, your physical well-being, your social context, your psychological facts about your you and your opponent are really all that relevant. You may be, you know, thinking in terms of deep blue, where you you know you just plot ahead long enough in the game and you know, you'll kind of make progress against this. But what he's saying here is that if we take a bit of a step back and we start to, to probe into what game are we actually playing? And is there perhaps a super game or, or some kind of a different way of looking at the game that provides us with a context through which each player can have all the information about the game, perhaps that would lead us to a C game, which is at that point tractable. So how do you get there? Uh, so the set of strategies here ceases to become kind of a limited uh, set of strategies from one player's perspective. But the set of possible strategies shared by all players. So for example, if you are in you know, the, the, the context of the Second World War, you will want to look at the Magnot line, if I'm pronou pronouncing that correctly, uh, in, in terms of, you know, the, the Germans, if they are going to attack France, have to either go around it, over it, under it, through it, etc. Uh, and then each of these possible strategies will get a probability associated with them, and some of these probabilities will be extremely low. However, it is important in this context to enumerate all of them so that we can get to the C game if we can get there. Uh, similarly, the possible information states of all players. So this is going to be why we were talking about the psychological state, the social state, the, the anything that you can open your mind to to model the opposing player is, as long as you can capture him in his entirety, as long as you can create a model of your player that acts as though your player would act, even if it is not necessarily 
you know, each way of viewing your player is accurate. As long as there is a probability attached to all of it, uh, that will be kind of a, a, a step towards that direction. So, uh, again, we have this kind of view of all possible strategies, view of all possible information states. So, again, in the context of business, what possible bank account balances will your uh, competitors have? Well, you can kind of, you know, create a, a model of, of that, even if you don't know it exactly. Um, you know, you're, not, you're not going to be going up against, for example, a trillion dollar business as a lemonade stand. Uh, that, that may be something you can exclude a prior on. And then, again, you can ex kind of create uh, a, a list of all possible uh, states of information shared and not shared by each player. So you can kind of create a list of possible states uh, or possible bits of information that each you know, or player knows about the other. Um, and again, we're starting to get into these really large, not even theoretical, almost impossible to, 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 to kind of formulate uh, groupings of information. But if we kind of continue in this direction, we're, you can start to see that we're, we're, we're approximating a really large C game, but it's going to be a C game nevertheless. And so we're, we're going to create a, a, another game. And the, the, the core idea here is that it's going to have the same payoff function. I'm going to call this game G star. It's going to have the same payoff function. It's going to have the same set of possible states. And, and here's another kind of and here. Each player is going to get a random, or what, from the context of this game, a random vector assigned to it. And that random vector is going to be, uh, I guess, defined to be This information, I guess, vector is going to contain the same information, but in the context of this game, it's going to be treated as a random variable. So we're, we're basically going to be choosing a random possible state for the context of this game. We are going to be choosing for this game, given our, I guess, models of what the player could be, a random part of that. And we're going to add a constraint to that where
So we're going to be adding a constraint to this where the information that both players know, given that the given if some information vector is chosen, the probability that they know it is going to be equal to this integral here of the I guess one iterated over the that information times the probability of both that information being the case and again this is not the exponential but this probability of the uh, that being the case given it being true. So again, so you kind of take it take or leave that particular constraint, but just know that there is kind of this balancing constraint needed in order to, uh, I guess, enforce this this game's consistency or this game's relation to the original game. Now, it's designed in this particular way so that the two games are what are called Bayes equivalent, uh, quite possibly a term coined in this, uh, this paper, which is that uh, a Bayesian player would play this, the two games uh, the same, or, or specifically that a decision rule that governs the Bayesian player's behavior or moves would be the same in both games, i.e. the rule upon which that player plays or lives by is the same in both games and is not, I guess, changed. Because if it was a different game, he would play by a different set of rules, etc. So in the context of a business situation, for example, uh, two business contexts are the same if your business logic applies in both of them. Uh, and if you would act upon that business logic in both of them, that would be, that would be said to be a Bayesian equivalent situation uh, for your particular business if you were acting rationally if your business is not dumb, going back to the Bayesian hypothesis. So the I idea is that you are, these two games, you're, you're playing them the same, you're, you're investing the same, you're acting the same, and your, your, your rule, your decision rule is, is not changing between the two. So the outcome in those two games may be extremely different. In one game you may win, in one game you may lose, in one game you may, you know, succeed, in one game you may, you know, ha get nuked and, and ha lose everything. However, the important thing is how you play, and the important principle is for you to play optimally, and for you to play as smart as possible at this kind of Bayesian level of optimum rationality. And so, if these two games are Bayesian equivalent, i.e. this original game, which is a game of incomplete information, where you do not know the, the principles that your opponent is operating on, for example, and this kind of broader, albeit complete game, where you at least have a probability defined for your opponent's actions, uh, and a random vector selected based on that probability, at least you can play that. You, you basically can play a perfect game in that particular game. In, in this G-Star, you can actually play a perfect game. You, you can do all the moves optimally. You can, you can solve this game for what you would do in that game. And because this focuses on the rule between these two games, different players are going to have different decision rules. It kind of makes sense that what would be a Bayesian equivalent for one particular player may not be a Bayesian equivalent game for another particular player. So you almost never know what game you're playing with your opponent. Your opponent may be playing kind of an entirely different game because you as an opponent create that entirely different game for for that particular opponent to, to play up against. 
your psychological makeup, your, you know, whether or not you're having a good day, whether or not you're having a bad day, each of these basically creates a new type of game that your opponent is playing, and you are not necessarily. Another thing to note about these G-Star games is that, uh, I guess, C games uh, have what's called perfect recall. I, you can remember all the moves going back to the beginning of the game. This may not be true with I games. It, with eye games, you may be constrained. You, I don't know if they specifically had come up with the idea of bounded rationality at that point, but at, at, at the very least, the, the models of the games they had uh, for eye games included games where you could not remember going back to a certain number of moves. Perhaps, you know, the, game, the card game Mamma Mia, uh, that's a, a good example of a game where it's, it's really hard to remember after a few plays what exactly happened. Uh, in I games, you're going to get lost. In, in these C games, the assumption is is that there is perfect recall, so you can come up with uh, what are called Bayesian strategies and mixed strategies, and that the two will be equal. Uh, if you may remember from the previous video, talking about that. So you may remember the random vector model kind of centered around being able to define these single vectors that contained all the information about a player. Your bank account, you know, maybe what you had for breakfast this morning in the, in the, the expanded version of the game. But this is going to be a whole bunch of information. And this is going to be a lot of things to model. So if, if we can possibly avoid that, uh, that might help us actually do this in the real world. Uh, or something approximating it on a computer. Uh, one step towards that is what's called the prior lottery model. Um, and so this is going to be uh, a, 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 a bit of a departure from the, the previous one, but it's still going to be in kind of the spirit of it. So if you, I guess, are playing a game, you consider yourself to be a random chance any, I guess, grander uh, view of things, just as you would in the random vector model. Uh, so, for example, you would consider your position as starting at a random point along the, I guess, Gini uh, curve, or the Gini coefficient curve, uh, if you were playing a, a, a business context. Uh, so, that there is a kind of inherent model of the, the broader context. So, so again, for, for the business context, you take for granted that there is a certain level of inequality and that there is a certain level of you know, businesses that are producing at any given point, at any given market, any given you know, price point, etc. And then you kind of consider yourself as selecting at random from that. Um, as well as your opponent, as a kind of random selection from you. So as long as you know the distribution that determines, I guess, the, the initial set of uh, inequality, so for example, in, in the case of a nuclear arms conflict or potential conflict, um, the, the chance of an aggressive uh, opponent, the chance of a sane opponent, the chance of a you know, peaceful opponent, uh, if you can model that dynamic, you can create a, a, I guess, selection from it. And so you, you basically set the probabilities of the states that you know not to be the case to be zero, and then you set the probability for the strategies in your initial game to be zero for, for strategies you can confirm that your opponent will not be using. Uh, and kind of work your way from there. So, similarly to the last game, the last game kind of, or the last view of things kind of centered around choosing a player at random. Whereas in this context, you're kind of choosing more of the game at random. And so, you're, you're, you're choosing the, 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 
example, from a superset of possible games, what game you are actually playing at random, and acting upon that. Uh, now players may find this kind of situation familiar. The specifically uh, something that comes or becomes useful in the context of this choosing a game at random to play uh, is that an outside observer actually makes sense in this context, uh, and in particular, the outside observer has the information that is common to all players. So if, if both the Russians and the Americans know that both the Russians and the Americans have nuclear weapons, uh, then that becomes some common information for both the players, and an outside observer can note that. And it turns out that you can actually model uh, a distribution of initial values for each player's and the marginal distribution of probability based on common knowledge and kind of work towards the knowledge that a player has based on that common, starting from the priors of that common knowledge. And the, the idea that follows from that, so you start with start with the common knowledge, you then work from the common knowledge to your strategy, and then you assume that your opponent is doing the same, and then you resolve, I guess, wh what happens at that point. Now, note that this does not, this part doesn't seem to make sense, because you should be starting from the combination of common knowledge and your information to govern your, your particular strategy. But that's not what the, this model does. And the reason that it doesn't do this is because it's not, your, your model is not basically creating you, it's creating a, a model of the world based on the assumptions that you have, and then based on common knowledge, an outside observer would make these things. So, this is basically forcing yourself to step back and view the, 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 the situation as an outside observer would be capable of given the common knowledge involved and then creating a strategy from that. And then because you're assuming that the other player is doing the same, there is a condition or a conditional expectation based on that strategy for each strategy uh, for each possible type of player. And so you're, you're basically starting with, in a random game, creating this strategy for a random player, and then kind of creating a maximum uh, strategy based on that. Uh, this in particular works for perfect information, uh, but you can't justify uh, all strategies based on maximum and minimax alone. But we'll get you equilibrium where uh, both players will, will play a certain set of points uh, because it makes sense to do so, and because one of them would lose uh, at least some value in choosing a different point. So, continuing from here, so we have a, I guess, a, a what's called a normalizing strategy, where the you start with a, a sequence of phase strategies and a function from, I guess,
this information space to strategy space. And so if you use these normalized strategies instead of your strategies, that kind of uh, tightens the loop a little bit in terms of what you're, you're, you're doing in the big picture. Because this is where your information of your player comes into effect. You don't create your strategy based on what you know of the situation, based on the information you have. You create these, this set of functions that kind of does that for you. So you're pa basically using this, or using this as your criteria for, to pick a function of random, and that function encodes the information you know about the situation. And there is a what's called a semi-normalized view of the game. S S not to be confused with strategy. I don't know why they included that notation, but um, and S of G is equal to S of G star. A, so the sem semi-normalized version of the game is equivalent to the I guess semi-normalized version of our uh, C game, where the strategies are normalized, right, they're dependent on your information that you have, and the payoff functions are con also conditional on your information. So the this is a different way of kind of looking at, I guess. It, it, equivalent games, specifically uh, games of complete information and games of incomplete information. So if you can prove this is the case for your particular game, uh, you're, you're basically at a, at a level of uh, Bayesian equivalence. And specifically what, what this allows you to do is that if you solve the C game of, of G star, and you know that there is this uh, a semi-normalized equivalence going on, then you can use the same uh, solution that you, you came up with for g i.e. the same set of strategies for the original game uh, without having to, I guess, double check or w without having to go through the, the entire process on the, the high game side. And so, up until this point in history, uh, you really had to choose a strategy before the move started. Uh, and similar to the previous videos, uh, this kind of pushes and delays your commitment of a strategy to as late as possible so that you can adapt to the strategy, uh, adapt your strategy to the information you have based on this criteria. So it kind of pushes your reaction to a situation given the information you have in your model as late as possible. And this isn't the, the uh, delay of your choice. This is the delay of the strategy, depending on what player you are. And so, again, this is kind of a, a view of games in terms of not necessarily, you know, I'm, I'm playing against John Smith, but I'm playing against John Smith given the information that he knows. And given that he is a John Smith about to play a certain set of moves of a set of possible John Smiths who could play a larger superset of those possible loops. This principle apparently uh, replaces a stronger uh, normalization principle called von Neumann's and Morgenstern's norm normalization principle. Uh, again, that's just kind of a side note. Now, what, uh, under what conditions do we, do we assume that these, these two things, this you know, admissibility uh, of these two games, uh, like at, at what point does it make sense to act in this way? And so we're going to split the possibilities.
So the first possibility is the game itself is inconsistent. It gives rewards based on illogical, um, impossible to predict uh, ways. So even if you uh, act in a you know, perfectly Bayesian way, it turns out there's still going to be some games where you, you, you just cannot win. Entropy, you could probably view in this context, where you, you just can't win. You, you play a game against Entropy, you lose. Uh, you, you play a game with multiple players where the payoffs uh, are not consistent. There is no perfect strategy. There is no Bayesian strategy you can play. The best strategy you can play is the Bayesian one, but you still do not win with it. Then there are going to be decomposable games. So there are going to be games where you're able to split apart the game into two subgames and then solve each game independently, which the games may be decomposable or not. Um, the decomposable games may even be finite or infinitely de decomposable. Uh, that, again, um, as long as you're you know, playing in this, in this context of a uh, C game, it should be uh, decomposable, but if you decompose into an, an I game, uh, as long as you're able to apply the same model to, to get yourself a C game from that I game, you should be fine. So each there's going to be games that you cannot decompose, games that for which the you, you basically have a game that you have to solve as is. And within this game there are going to be a finite uh, I guess, set of possible states that that game can be in. Um, the your information space that you and your opponent knows are, is actually going to partition this uh, possible space. Uh, and it's going to give it a distribution. Uh, so, uh, if you have this, then your the, the partitions are going to be equal to your distribution, the, the, dis the distribution given. Because we know that it's not an inconsistent game, there's going to be a set of information that each player knows that allows that game to be, I guess, resolved with optimal strategies. So, the kind of drilling down, what do each of these mean? It's that the Bayesian strategy does not actually give us anything, but there's nothing we can do about it anyway. That the Bayesian strategy only applies if we can decompose the game. So basically the first thing step, and then the step where uh, we basically assume that we have the right strategy, we use the right strategy to split up, or to, to make use of the, the split up game in terms of the information that we know about the space the information that we know about the game. So there's another kind of assumption that it is a highly likely prior, although not necessary, which is that you assume to begin with that you do not have an inconsistent game. That whenever you're presented with a game, unless you have evidence otherwise, uh, the likelihood that a game is inconsistent especially for the kinds of things that you would model game theory about, um, tend to be statistically improbable. And so if you assume that they are not inconsistent, you can kind of jump right away into decomposing it. Kind of a shortcut. Might be cheating, but uh, statistically it, it should work. It is reasonable to assume.
So this is going to basically tell us uh, that a, any particular tie game that we play is actually a C game that's a result of a random social process that selects n players uh, from a possible set of players who could play. So where we basically define players to be um, the, the person you're playing with with that particular piece of information that they actually have. And that, in particular, that they will be selected as a function of your information. So, again, it might be worth kind of flipping back to, to look at the random vector model. So the random vector model was all about selecting the vector of information that a player was, def that it, not that the player was defined by, but that, for example, the information the player had was defined by. So given your particular, uh, you, know, you, you know that it's the United States versus Russia, for example, but you don't necessarily know how, what the Russians' uh, production capabilities are. You have to estimate some of those things. Uh, would be in the, the random vector model. But in the prior lottery model, you're actually not necessarily coming up against the United States and Russia. You're coming up as the United States against a possible Russia, a possible Russia with a little bit more production, a possible Russia with a little bit less production, a possible Russia that is sane, a possible Russia that it is not sane, and so on and so forth. You're, you're playing against a, a possible Russia that has had a leader with a bad day, a leader with a good day today. Um, it is, this is part of your model. Um, and it is, depending on the information you have, you select a random player based on that. Now, given this view of the game, uh, if you can only see part of the game, that is evidence that your opponents can also see only part of the game. Um, it may not be foolproof evidence, but it is a highly likely thing. In addition, you can come up with some, I guess, Status. So some, I guess, approximations to the information partition uh, based on what you and your opponent knows, uh, which takes into account what an observer would know, i.e. what you would expect both you and your opponent to know. Uh, and in particular, if you do come up with this R star, and you know that there is in internal inconsistency in this model, uh, then that, going back to the inconsistent games, you know, at what point do you start to believe that your game is inconsistent? Well, it is at that point. It is when you notice that there is inconsistent information given what you and what you would expect your opponent to know um, based on random selections of you and your opponent, uh, then that's evidence that the game itself is inconsistent. Now, what that actually allows you to do is that allows you to, to break kind of the initial assumption a little bit. Because you can always assume that you're playing against a Beijing player, but because you're only playing against a player picked at random at any given point, uh, your player may be playing perfectly rational for your, for, for, or I guess your opponent may be playing perfectly rational given the information he has at the, the, the current moment, but in the next moment he will have seen your, or evidence of your strategy, he will have seen the results of something that you have done, he will have seen, you know, perhaps something that he had done and the results of that. Uh, basically, this selects a different player for every move. And that allows you to create players that are locally rational, but globally stupid. And you, 
can kind of view that as a, a game where you're, you're basically playing, if you imagine something like chess, where you're playing against one person who then makes a move, the smartest move he knows how to make, and then walks away. He doesn't communicate his information to other players. Now, again, we're, we're, we're thinking in terms of games, which is a pretty broad category of social activity. And this is going to include things like uh, protest movements. Uh, right now in Hong Kong, there's a large protest movement, uh, Occupy Central, uh, and that is going to involve the, cho the choice between uh, peaceful, nonviolent social change and violent, uh, revolutionary social change. Um, if you are a government and you're playing the game of, you know, smack down the occupier or whatever you want to call it, uh, your, your opponent could be peaceful, it could be violent, uh, and in particular you're, you're going to be having to model their particular strategy either way at every point of the game. And so this fire lottery model is going to basically be selecting an opponent that makes the choice peaceful or uh, revolutionary at every, any given point. And it's going to be doing that based on the possible histories given and constrained by what you know about that movement. So, for example, if you know that every single person or every single individual in a position of authority in that movement uh, has, you know, strong uh, predispositions to non-violent action, uh, that will constrain the random possible player that you're playing against among them to, you know, a presumably non-violent course. Uh, but in situations like uh, social movements, there, there's going to be a degree of chance and a degree of who gets in charge, and you're, you're basically, it, it's going to model very closely this idea of selecting a player randomly. So, the, this R, this, this combination of what you know and what your opponent knows, uh, this is what you're going to have to basically build based on large possible factors that include uh, what could cause your opponent to believe certain things and possible past experiences, possible paths to your current position in the game. So again, taking a bit of a step back, what, what are they doing, or what is Harsanyi doing here? He is trying to create a large information space of all possible outcomes and all possible ways that those outcomes could be reached, and then kind of drilling them down using this, uh, the fact that it's a C game to provide a expected value of the game based on the strategies, based on the histories, based on the information available at that game. If, or even if you can, you can take into account, uh, or, or, or if you can't take into account the full uh, opponent, if you are, you know, coming into problems where you can't trace all of their possible histories, uh, even if the game is inconsistent, um, or, or for, or rather, e even if it seems that the game is inconsistent, it's still likely that the game is consistent. And if you were to take into account all the possible information, i.e., so if, if the game looks incons inconsistent and you notice that you have a, a whole bunch of lacking information about your opponent player, uh, then one thing that that allows you to do uh, is it, it allows you to, to kind of fudge that player to allow consistency. Uh, it is assumed in this paper that when you get to the point of previous life history, uh, I, at the most general possible level, that things are actually consistent. That there is a universe within which we are consistent, and it is assumed that the, the alternative players know certain things about that universe, and that you know certain things about that universe, 
but that the universe itself has some degree of consistency. If the universe that we're all living in is in itself inconsistent, then again, Bayesian or not, we're all screwed. We can't actually uh, act rationally, um, so we may as well try uh, and uh, see how far we get. And so, uh, again, we're, we're, we're kind of jumping around a little bit, but uh, this, this kind of splits games into uh, classes where there's a, I, I guess, outcome that you can reach, um, or so, so basically, at that point, if you're able to create this consistent game, you split the your game into this the, this this more general game of classes of outcomes and then solve that game and then using that strategy apply to your current game. Now there's a third model. Selton model, and it's very much like the, the fire model. Yeah, you, you're 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 choosing the game, and you're you're choosing the player within that game uh, per per move, but the decision is made after the game starts. And so you begin player, or you begin you basically begin playing the game, and you still do not know who you're playing against. You do not, you, you have a a, a model generator, I suppose, that will allow you to do that, but the, the, within the, the first game, you don't actually know who you're playing against. And how this is going to work is that you're basically going to be playing, instead of against one player, against K players. which there's going to be K minus N imaginary players and N players, so uh, your opponents and these kind of constructed players uh, that function to kind of balance out some of the probability uh, in inherent in the game. After everyone chooses their strategy for a round, one player from each class is selected. So K is split up into these partitions, these classes. And at the end of the round, for each for each I and M, a player is selected. And so, within the random uh, vector model, you don't need these imaginary players. And within the, the prior lottery model, you don't need these imaginary players. But it does turn out that when you include these imaginary players, the, the, I guess, grouping of the game into a consistent game, or in, into a game of complete information, becomes much easier. Um, so, if, if you, and it's kind of easy to imagine that, you know, if, if you imagine a whole bunch of players with more information about the game, you can make the game, you know, such that all the all the players together have the whole of the information of the game uh, and can interact such that their strategies kind of tell each other that much quicker. So, in, in a little bit of summary, uh, this these three models don't work very well when you can't model the context in which the game is being played. It's going to work somewhat well for games like Global Nuclear War, where there are maybe two, ten, I don't know when Paul Dama gets the bomb, but whatever the amount of players you have with the bomb. Uh, and you're, you're basically modeling the choice of nuclear war and conventional attacks. Uh, notably because after a couple of thousand years of warfare, uh, 
not a whole lot is changing very quickly. Yes, we're getting flying robots. Yes, we're getting you know little things here and there. But uh, in general, you can you can kind of see what's coming into the future uh, coming a little ways away. Even if you're not sure that your opponent is going to employ them, then you can include that in in your information vector in your possible player uh, or your possible imaginary player as it is. And so you can kind of get a general feel for what the strategies that are going to be coming down the line could be, even if you don't know the specific probability of them. Now remember, as long as we can come up with a distribution and a function that generates players based on the information you have, uh, the, the probabilities themselves don't need to be fully accurate as long as they are, or rather they don't need to be fully precise as long as they are accurate. Um, the more accurate, of course, the better. But the important thing is not necessarily to get, in this context, is not necessarily to get the probabilities right. Uh, the important thing is to act appropriately given the probabilities that you know. Uh, if you're in a game, the goal is to act rationally. The goal is to use the same decision, or to come up with the optimal decision rule. To, to come up with the way of approaching the game such that it, it is rational to approach it in that way. And then you can kind of feed in the probabilities to that strategy or to that way of looking at uh, your, your game after you have come up with that decision rule. And so if your game is something like war, where, uh, again, the, 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 the game of war is not changing all that rapidly, uh, this may be appropriate. But in other situations, uh, for example, in high technology, where all sorts of disrupting things happen all the time and it is very difficult to formulate a game which takes these dis massive disruptions into account and paradigm changes into account. This kind of, these three models will not uh, act very well towards that. Now, kind of as an aside, uh, on the Bayesian hypothesis, if your opponent isn't perfectly rational, uh, you can use what's called a Dutch book attack on them. And so you can e exploit their irrationality and gain an advantage in the game. Now, you have to conclude at some point that your opponent is not rational and depart from your own rational view of things. Uh, so the, you know, how to do that, you, know, you, you may want to look up and, and figure out on your own. But the, the basic idea is that if you start with the assumption that they are rational, these three models should work. Uh, and so you apply those three in those cases, and then I guess in, in the event that you can, you can prove that your opponent isn't rational, you can depart from those three models. And so in general, if you can use the information about what kind of a player you are to determine the probability of you being in that game as, I guess, you with those characteristics. Uh, and your opponent doesn't do this, again, you, can, you have a, a, a bit of an advantage. And you can have a more accurate model of the game given that. So, kind of... Again, uh, this is Jeff Cliff, and to kind of summarize, uh, your, what game are you playing can be randomized. The player who you are and who your opponents are can be randomized in your model, so that based on what you know about them and the game itself, uh, you can view that as something that changes and is selected. You can view the the, the, the game itself is changing and being selected for, and subsets of that game uh, can be either decomposed or not decomposed, uh, can be inconsistent, and the application of the optimal strategy in either case uh, can be used to uh, 
I guess, converge in the ways we kind of discussed. So, uh, again, hopefully that wasn't, um, I guess, too much of a gloss over. There, there are proofs for some of these ideas in the, the paper that Harsanyi has created. Uh, again, it's not necessarily, or not necessarily that you know the proof or that you understand the proof, but just being able to force yourself uh, to, to open your mind, to view the entire situation as, and all possibilities that that situation can unfold, however absurd, and then to be able to constrain that based on what you know about yourself and your opponent. Uh, even if it's computationally intractable, uh, this is what we're going to try to do, and this is in our third idea of the past 50 years. So, um, enjoy your uh, attempts at uh, taking Bayesian statistics and, uh, and then applying them in that direction.